Hey, I could be talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me now? I can hear you. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, everybody's been telling me not to ad lib. Uh, <laughs> through the uh, apparently, I can't make the banners work, so I'm ad libbing my way through the, the time. And everybody's, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Stephen, it's a it's a it's a skill. When I get scared, I freeze up and I don't move. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Ramage said he thought I was frozen. <laughs> frozen, frozen fear, man. Um, I, yeah, thought you, anyway. I, thought, I thought you were looking for your cat. Yeah, everything's going great on this end. We're, uh, you know, with with, uh, with uh, and Andrea hasn't fired me. Uh, Andrea, Andrea, I'm, I'm mispronouncing uh, the names. I um, I can get Paul. I can get that right. So, uh, <laughs> so, without, so I've done, I've done one thing right. I've got the right name. Hey, you, you're halfway there. And where where are you located? Uh, I am currently in central London. Excellent. And couldn't be, current, couldn't be further from the, the, the vert if I tried. <laughs> current temperature? Uh, it's pretty close to freezing, actually. It's a really horrible day. Oh, man. <laughs> we had ice storms. Oh, man. Holy crud. Well, oh. Welcome to a London September. <laughs> well, the uh, goes, from, goes from blazing sun to ice storms before you know. Uh, I like it. Here in southeast Tennessee, we've got um, clouds, and uh, yeah, it's kind of eh, it's okay. Nothing, nothing terrible. So I guess we'll get started. Um, since I'm probably running late now, um, yeah. Andre keeps telling me I'm not fired from my speaking <laughs> gig. Who knows? So. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Paul Harwood, and we're we're going to talk about uh, Virtus, virtual GIS, and virtual reality. Um, Paul Harwood has been in the software industry for thirty years with roles in Capgemini, Nokia, and Google, covering development, architecture, project management, sales, and product development. So, with that, I will dive off and add in your screen. And uh, good luck. Ah, okay. Can you see my screen? I can. Okay. Ah, okay. I've got two screens. Sorry. That's what the problem is. Can you see my screen now? As you can, as you, can you see the slides? You are good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a delay. Hey. I've got another screen. Um, okay. My You're halfway there. Out. Yeah, my name's... <laughs> My name is Paul Harwood. Um, as, um, as as Randy just said, um, I'm basically a a, a, a long time uh, a software developer and uh, a project manager. Uh, and I'm presenting some work that my company and a associated company have done, which is called Virgis, which is a open source tool uh, platform for doing GIS in virtual reality. Um, so the, the partners are Runet Software, which is basically a small software consulting company run by me, does GIS, particularly with a kind of background in archaeology and and and, and historical um, types of applications based in London. And uh, a geo consulting company called Iskoid, based in Swansea in Wales, which I don't know why I just put on a really naff Welsh accent when I said that. Uh, and we basically have been working together on this. Um, I'm going to go quickly through um, why VR, some background into VR, uh, Virgis. I've got a couple of example videos because unlike Christopher, I did not read the presenter guidelines, so therefore I don't know I'm not supposed to do it. Uh, and the, the main case study, which is a, a, a quarry case study done, done by Iskoid. Um, the abstract did talk about a point, um, a point cloud case study as well. We didn't get the permission to use that data. I've got a video of point of point clouds in Virgis instead. So um, at this point, I'd usually in this presentation go into what GIS is and why we need GIS and why we need three dimensional GIS. I'm actually assuming that this audience doesn't need any of that. So I'm going to go straight into why virtual reality um, and what does virtual reality bring to us? And I'm going to start this conversation, this off by by just going through two exemplar use cases, which kind of drove the th our, our thinking about why to do this. 
Um, uh, one from kind of, kind of an archaeological background and one just talking about, you know, uh, geophysics. Um, uh, this is Josh Emmett. This is not to say that Josh Emmett in any way, um, who's a, a, a doctor in archaeology in, in the University of Auckland, is in any way associated with the project. This was just a paper that he presented that kind of sparked off some of the thoughts. Uh, and this is a typical use case. I think Christopher mentioned it as well um, about uh, going through an archaeological trench where increasingly these days they record every single find using a total station. So they get a huge three dimensional, all, 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 a huge point cloud, all point clouds are three dimensional um, of, of data points. Uh, what in this case they'd like to do or they did is run a, 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 a a kernel density analysis over the points to create a probability function, you know, a, a volumetric a probability function, which then, because the z direct, the z dimension is in archaeology a, a, a proxy for time dimension, gives you uh, a time function for the probability of particular uh, activities across the, um, the, the the plan of the of the site. Um, the problem they've got is there's no really useful way of actually visually inspecting and understanding the, the, the volumetric output from the, the, the point cloud uh, kernel density analysis, um, basically because all you get is this vaguely woolly thing on the screen, uh, and which is kind of represented in the corner down there. So one the, the sort of how can we understand and, and, uh, and get into the data, uh, when, especially when it's three-dimensional and even more when it's volumetric. Um, and the other case, which is much more of the driving case, which is the, the geophysics un understanding. And um, basically, um, geophysicists like the people at SCOID, uh, which is run by my brother, so I will occasionally talk about my brother unconsciously. Um, the people at SCOID, they, they get remote sensing data from under the ground, and they put that together into a three-dimensional model and try and understand it. Uh, and that's a, a complicated thing for the practitioners to do um, uh, because, and I think actually I'm going to nick a, um, something that Christopher said in one and a half presentation, two presentations ago. Uh, and the typical GIS and data visualization, visualization tools that I use at the moment, you're outside the data looking in, you're above the data trying to understand this thing that's happening on the screen and you're trying to sort of see it from outside of the data. Um, whereas what the particular practitioners really need and also want to be is actually inside the data, surrounded by the data, understanding the data and interacting with the data in a naturalistic and intuitive way. And this is what virtual reality brings you. You can create a true three-dimensional space with data in it. I mean, I mean true three-dimensional. Um, you can then enter into the data, enter into that space, and enter inside the data and understand it using the, the three-dimensional senses that we have evolved and, and we have grown up with. And then uh, with Verges at the moment, you can interact with the data in um, mechanical and understandable and intuitive ways move the data around. Uh, and so the, what virtual reality gives you is this um, being immersed in the data. And when we've, we've worked with practitioners for the first time looking at this, the most common thing that people say is, wow, I'm actually inside my data. Uh, and this is the reaction that we, 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 we try and create for people. So that's just a quick understanding about what we're trying to do in virtual reality and why virtual reality would be different to not virtual reality. Um, I'm now going to go through a kind of a quick overview of, uh, of this platform that we've called Verges. So Verges is a, it's a, it's an open source platform that will allow, to allow um, GIS to be done within uh, virtual reality. Um, we created this as part of our work to understand, you know, because because uh, Iskoy came to us and said uh, that they wanted to do data visualization of GIS within virtual reality. So we programmed it in such a way to create a, an open source platform that, other, that if other people wanted to use, they could use. Um, the key factors 
about what Virgis is, um, I'm going to start off by saying what it isn't. Virg Virgis is not intended to be a tool for creating visualizations of, um, it's not a cool to create a tool for, for creating um, model, uh, visualizations of things, uh, of pictures within reality. It's not like city JSON, a way of uh, you know, creating a virtual, uh, virtual reality model of a, of a city. It's not like some people are doing within archaeology, a way of creating a model of what a particular um, building would have looked like at a particular period. It is a model for, 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 for visualizing and viewing data. Um, sometimes those things might be indistinguishable, but a lot of the time they're not. I, if you want to see a, 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 a raster within three dimensions with some um, um, cross sections and ERT sections within three dimensions all co-located and being tied it and create a mesh that identifies particular features within that data, you're not in any way creating anything that that that, that is uh, photo realistic or realistic, but but you are interacting with data in virtual reality in 3D, and that is the model that Virgis tries to do. Uh, uh, its other its other key factor is it's um, intended to be used in real time with native data formats to allow the data to be edited, and then to store the yeah, within the native format. So it's designed, it's intended to, 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 to look at data in native formats and not, not accept the data to be pre-processed. It is, as I say, a, an open source community-led project. Uh, at least the core is, I'll come back to that. Um, the core is the, the part of the product that takes the data and creates objects within a three-dimensional space um, with certain characteristics and, 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 and visualizations um, uh, that's in, then intended to be used by other applications, uh, which and they need to add certain things. So I'll come to it in a minute. So we came up with some key design criteria. Um, the key, the key, key, well, the key, key design criteria was no pre-processing, uh, no need to take it. Uh, and uh, this is not in any way intended to you know, say that other people are wrong by doing this, but our, our model is. We want to take the native data. We don't want to have to take that through Blender, create OBJs, create uh, meshes and structures, which we then um, bake into a, a, a custom um, VR application. We are looking to create an application that can, in real time, take data in, in its usual format and then create visualizations in virtual reality that, 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 that show that data. Uh, the other thing is, the key thing is that the user should be able to edit data. Um, we're getting there. Um, we can, for instance, at the moment, edit meshes, edit, edit DXFs. We can edit vector data. Uh, editing things like rasters, we, the, you then get into some of the, the contextual models about what you actually want to do there. So we can move them around and we can geolocate them, but we can't edit, we can't edit the data. And I'm not sure we'll ever get to that point or, or want to. Um, we wanted a, co a, a separation between the core functions, which I just mentioned, the ability to represent and indeed edit um, data within the virtual reality space from the UI and the headset and the integration between the UI and the headset. Uh, and, and the, the, uh, between the user and the and the headset. Um, this is to, uh, primarily for two reasons. For 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 two reasons. Um, one is that there are many different headsets and they're moving fast and trying to create a, an open source project that that could keep track of the headset market uh, would be very very difficult. So obviously separating the, the two functions allows the library to exist without having needing to have knowledge of the headset. And then allows people to take that library and, and integrate it with the headset of their choice. And that creates more flexibility. Uh, and the other one is to allow innovation in the user interface and user, business oriented user interfaces and user interfaces in the sort of use case that we're talking about uh, is a very new and leading edge space. So, um, Nobody really knows how to do it well, so the, the, the scope for innovation basically means that, that that we can see which way it goes. Um, 
We also wanted the core to be extensible uh, so that other people could could use it to represent their own data in, in, in the way, any way they want to. Uh, we've done this using an entity model. Uh, the the Verges platform itself has got the name a very permissive MIT license, so anybody can can take it and use it in any way they want to. And uh, the entity model is represented by a schema, but the schema is extensible. Basically, you know, you can create your own schema and plug it in in replacement to the to the default one, which allows new types of um, layer and new types of model, new types of entity to be added to Verges without changing the core code, uh, which is actually what we do for the 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 lead product product which is a product we call at the moment calling Virgis Geo, which has the the basic Virgis plugin, um, the basic basic Virgis library, and adds a couple of layers, particularly around boreholes, which are hybrid layers which take data from all the other layers and represent them in particular ways. Um, it is also OS independent. Uh, it runs currently on Windows, on Mac, and on Linux. Obviously, all the the VR stuff and the the headset is primarily on Windows. That's because that's the market at the moment. Uh, so the the Linux and uh, a Mac is a, a desktop type viewer. And in fact, we have for all platforms for Windows as well. We have two two clients at the moment: uh, a desktop client and a VR client. Uh, I will be showing some videos in a minute, uh, hopefully, and. The videos are all taken from the desktop client because taking a video from a VR from a headset client is actually really difficult, mostly because people don't keep their head still. It's very unnatural to keep your head still when you're looking through when you're work when you're walking through data. Uh, but if you take a video of that, you get something that makes the people watching the video seasick. So we will be showing uh, something that comes from the desktop client, uh, which is more like a desktop viewer. Uh, it's a, it, the difference is the difference between walking through data or flying a drone through the data. And so what you'll see is more like somebody flying a drone through a data and giving you a, a, a television screen view of what they see. The technology background, um, Virgis is based on Unity, uh, primarily because Unity is 50% of the market and it works and it's available. Um, uh, and it, it allowed us to kickstart the project really quickly. Um, Unity, of course, is not itself open source. Uh, it is widely available and freely available, um, especially for startups. And it, Unity allows you to compile a client, and then you can li license the client any way you want to. Uh, but if obviously, if your revenue gets above $100,000 uh, a year, then you have to start paying something back to Unity. That's the the the... The compromise that we've taken at the moment. I think somebody's probably going to ask about Godot, uh, and at the moment we are, to use the original term, origin of the name, waiting for Godot. Um, because Virgis is written in in Unity, or indeed if it was written in Godot as well, it's written in C sharp. Um, it's written in C sharp and Mono, so it is that that's it. That itself is open source as well. It's built upon GDAL, PDAL, and MDAL as the main as the as the data abstraction layers um we make a lot of use of mdal probably more than than than, than qg is, does for instance because uh meshes are uh, significantly more important in three-dimensional um uh, gis we've also got some other uh uh, uh free and open source C sharp libraries that should be used in there. There's one called geometry three sharp, which is the basic is the, the core geometry tool that we use. Uh, net DXF because we load DXFs in native uh, format, not through GDAL. Uh, and it's all uh, reactive based. There's a there's actually a, re a reactive implementation for unity that we use. Um, as I say, the core implements the, the entity model, the visible objects. So it's basically placing the data within the th three-dimensional space, the virtual reality space. And any consuming applications of the, of the library then have to provide the user interface, the lights, and the cameras. So way virtual reality works is there is a coordinate space, this Cartesian coordinate space, as Christopher mentioned as well. Um, we place objects within that. Uh, the objects have shape, they have color, they have texture. Um, but to see them, you then have to place a camera within the space, and it's the output from the camera 
it either gets passed to the the, the screens on your uh, head, head up display or the screen on the PC. And you have to move that camera around within the space to represent the movement of the person. All of that integration is, is not part of the Virgis library. That's part of the consuming application. Uh, finally, Virgis library itself is published as a UPM package. UPM, as probably most people on this do not know, uh, is the Unity Packet Management System. It's basically NPM. Uh, <laughs> they've just created their own uh, small universe of NPM. And like NBM, you use scoped, scoped registries, and there's one scoped registry which is totally open, and is run by an open source community, and that's open to UPM, which is the one that Virgis is published on. So that's the technology. Ooh. Being very late. The entity model, uh, it's a very typical one. It is a layered uh, entity model. The record set in there is similar to a layer in Virgis. Uh, and then anything that GDAL, uh, OGR, PDAL, MDAL, or, or indeed an OBJ or uh, 3DS can be loaded as a feature collection. Um, I'm just going to quickly show some videos, probably not as many as, as, as I was intending. Or maybe even less, because the because the screen is not obeying me. No, I'm afraid we're going to have to go without the videos. But I'm going to go to uh, a use case. And this is a query within Derbyshire in the UK called Dallo, um, where they wanted a particular, a particular study. The study is of a feature which is called a doe line, um, which is a Northern English term for a sinkhole. So this is a, a place where water disappears into the ground. The study was intended to understand the, the underground um, configuration of the rock, particularly within with uh, uh, intention to pump a large amount of water into the, into basically into the fracture and hope it would go away. It's a way of getting rid of the water from the quarry. Um, the topography is it's a, a a depression in the ground um the geophysics they took was they took um a 12 uh, resistivity cross sections this is basically a tool they use to understand the, the resistance of the ground underneath the the, the cross section line uh they took 13 ground gpr ground penetration radar profiles again this is just firing a radar signal into the ground and, and collecting the responses to understand the different layers under the ground. And um, electromagnetic magnetic, magnetic survey across the top, which created a raster. Um, then the interpretation is you put all these three together and you try and look for the, the dough line structure uh, under, under the ground and trace where that goes to understand the amount of, the amount of water that it could cope with. Um, it says yeah, open voids appear as bodies of extremely high resistance. You know, uh, high water levels are low resistance. Um, I just very quickly I'll go through what would be the traditional workflow and then talk about the way that this was different within VR, to, so you can understand the the benefits that it brings. So traditionally, what they would do would be to go through the the, the resistivity cross sections, uh, try and identify uh, points on them that would represent a, uh, a, 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 a resistivity uh, um, um, contour, a resistivity contour. And then once they've done all of this, they use some tools to try and create a, a three or 2.5 dimensional surface from those points. And that would then represent a, a transition within the rock structure. And they can take volumes out of that. Um, Obviously, because they're just creating points, creating the, the work of creating the points from the cross, cross sections and working through a, a two dimensional screen to, to actually do that is kind of highly skilled and, is, and, 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 and takes a practitioner that's thinking in, in three dimensions and seeing it too. And then because they then have to automatically create the profile, the profile is not optimal. So the way that this was done within, within Virgis was uh, the data was all collected as a set of layers. Uh, the layers were, were entered through the, 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 the desktop tool, which we, we call landscape, um, that just, just collects the, 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 the date, the, 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 the location of the data, the link to the data, the file name, basically, 
uh, uh, the symbology, the 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 the, the CRS, uh, uh, and puts those into a, a JSON schema, which is then picked up by by the 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 the, 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 the VR application, um, uh, and then obviously the person involved then uh, I uh, opened the VR application with the headset they 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 stepped inside the data uh, and the bottom one here shows you know they're walking through the cross sections and actually mostly this is this is done the the scale is it is totally adjustable in real time but mostly this is done in one to one for this type of work so you you're actually working in real scale uh, against the data um they created a mesh and the way it works is the, we, uh, the mesh editing um the, the mesh is obviously a triangulated mesh each of the nodes can be moved individually or you can move a subsection of the mesh or you can move the whole mesh uh so you can map the, the mesh very very closely to the visual color contours that you're seeing in the data um you're, you're moving these these nodes centimeters either way to create the, the most optimal fit uh, and indeed the the result has been proven to be uh much much more accurate uh, against the actual data than the work they could get the, 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 than the results they can get from from doing this on the 2d screen and automatically creating the the, the profiles uh with that i think I'm probably going to have to stop because I think I'm out of time. Hello? Probably help if I unmuted myself. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm there for a man. yeah, I'm 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 getting I'm getting coached. I've I've had to get coaching skills through this. That was good. Um that uh Man, I'm trying to see if we've got any questions. We don't have any questions, but we're getting a lot of interaction in the chat. So um, can it export out the data? Can you export out the data into another piece of software? Um, or it need to stay within Verges? No, uh, uh, it's, it's all, the data is always kept in a native mode. So for instance, if, oh, okay. if your data is a vector file, it, it reads the vector file, uh, and then if you edit it, it, it writes it directly back into the same director vector file same for meshes so the rest the rasters are just brought in in native mode so there's actually no it, it can it, it can export automatically back straight back into the the file that you got the data from okay cool well awesome well with that um we're almost up with the next speaker uh anything else anything else you want to add um, you can tie in no, nope, I think that's cool. Okay. Awesome. Mr. Harwood, I appreciate it. That was good. Thank you, Thank you for the time and, and yeah. moderating it all. Excellent. Oh, cool. you don't. So let so me... You, uh, you turn this off. Yep. I will pop you out of here and there we go. Uh,